Everyone, hi, Bruce Muffson, LCSW from Sunridge of Nevada, coming at you with another music breakdown. Before we begin, just want to say again, Bruce Muffson, and I have the background that you're looking for. I've worked with people from 3 to 83. I've assessed thousands of people from all walks of life, inpatient, outpatient, been to prisons, been to hospitals, have testified hundreds of times in court. I've given dozens of speeches about mental health issues, and I'm fully versed in all kinds of trauma and all other kinds of mental illness that's out there. There's no one better than me, and what you get is rapid-fire answers to some very, very complicated questions. Now, also want to remind everybody that next week on the 22nd of this month, July 22nd, 5.30 West Coast time, we are doing our next training, and that's going to be on dysfunctional families. And I urge everyone to watch because the song I'm going to be talking about is going to directly relay why this is such an important topic. The price for it is $10 via PayPal. All the information is in the information box. And if you need to, you want to use crypto, no problem. Shoot us an email and we'll tell you how to make that work. Not an issue. So again, next Thursday, 530, 22nd of July, West Coast time, dysfunctional families, and all the information provided for you. Okay, tonight's song is interesting. On It really, on a personal level, it, it not only affected me, but something I can relate to. This was Eminem, and he put out a song called Darkness. And this song was to try and understand the mind of Stephen Paddock, Stephen Paddock, who committed mass murder, essentially, killing 58 people. And just recently, the 59th, one of his 59, unfortunately, she was a shooting victim, passed away from her injuries. So the count climbed to one more. And horrific, horrific situation. And Eminem wrote a song to try and explain the mindset of this person. So here we go. Anyway, everyone, of course, knows who Eminem is. Fantastic artist, fantastic writer. He's very, very good at double entendres, which I'll go over during this song. But I want to break down his mindset of how he tries to get inside the head of this mass murderer. Here we go. And again, oh, so I want to clarify one last thing. If I break down certain lines and leave certain lines out, that is because I'm looking at it clinically from my perspective. So people have often, will often ask me, why don't you cover the whole song, do every line? We no longer do that. We did initially. Now we just break down the segments that I feel are the most relevant to break down the song, and that's my clinical opinion. That's all. All right. In the chorus, it goes, I don't want to be alone in the darkness anymore. Well, that's a great example of what depression is. I don't want to be depressed. Now, he uses this over and over again. Hello, darkness, my old friend. He uses that, that line, which comes from a Simon and Garfunkel song from 1964. But he uses it throughout to kind of illustrate again further what this person was possibly going through. When you watch the video, you see Eminem initially alone. He's sitting in a room alone, and there's no one around, and there's darkness there. And he did a certain kind of playing with the, with the light and with the illustration, but the sense of discordant, he's by himself. He's trying to get into the shooter's mind. And the only thing, though, I want to bring up, I'm going to bring this up even further, the only thing that turned out to be odd about this person was that he used a service elevator because his bags were so filled with weapons that he brought to his room. So that really was the only odd thing that came out of this whole situation. But there are things I want to bring up later. Then it goes like this in verse 1. Can't get out of this hole I'm in. It's like the walls are closing in. You can't help me. No one can. I can feel these curtains closing. I go to open them, but something, something pulls them closed again. Okay, again, that is what depression looks like and what feels like. You never can see the light. You're always in darkness. You're always shrouded in gloom and unhappiness. Does that very, very well. Then he adds a really good line. Haven't got the faint, vaguest why I'm so lost. This, this is mental illness. You don't have an idea. You can't figure out how did I get this point in my life where I'm so dysfunctional. This is, I can't think straight. Now, what he does is he uses the video to try and illustrate the mindset of the person getting ready for the mass shooting at the Mandalay Bay at the concert. And it goes, I keep pacing this room, Valium, then chase it with booze. Okay, 
you got the drinking and you got the drug usage. That's what he's trying to, and you see in the video, there's bottles of pills, there's um, bottles of alcohol. Then you get this. If I pop any caps, it better be off vodka. Drunk, you got to find the courage. You got to drink heavily. Get, get used to what you're going to be doing. And round after round, I'm getting loaded. Ha ha. That's a lot of shots. Double entendre. You get the idea how he breaks that down. Verse two. Now I'm staring at the room service menu off of benzo. Benzodiazepines. Again, getting himself into a state where he's not being coherent, eating up those benzos. You know, getting himself high to get ready for the act. In a sense, trying to find the courage, the ability, the ability to be out of touch with reality to go ahead and start pulling that trigger. Then he goes, I'm armed to the teeth, another Valium fall off the bed. Like he's getting himself cranked, the Valiums, the Benzos, here's where it's going, here's where it's going, over and over again. And then he starts the shooting, and in the song it goes, got him hopping over walls and climbing fences. What was the goal of this? Just wanted to create terror. That actually did happen, by the way. He, he, people were climbing over walls, and they were climbing the fences, trying to get away from the gunfire. That actually did take place. Then at the end, he goes, no suicide note, just a note for target distance. That was true. When the police broke into his room, they found drawings and you know messages of how he was looking at wind velocity, uh, the distance of a bullet, you know, going down that distance, uh, elevation, you know, a wind speed. That was all there. He put that together. But here's where I want to clarify a couple of points. All right. Seven takeaways 10 months after the shooting. One of the most prolific, horrific events, not just in American history, world history. The carnage was unbelievable. But here's what came out of this person what they found. No motive ever came up. They were trying to find one. They went through every aspect of his life. They talked to his girlfriend. They talked to his brothers, people that knew him. There was no motive. None. There were indications of intent, though, because he was making reservations in cities that would have large outdoor music festivals, like Lollapalooza, for instance. And he was renting rooms to kind of scout out those venues. He prepared for the shootings, how? Because I went through his computers on SWAT tactics, on crowd size, weapons, explosives. He bought 55 weapons in the year leading up to this, most of them rifles. He was preparing for it, he was methodical. There was no second gunman. That was the thought also that he had help. There was no second gunman. It was just him. No suicide note or manifesto was found. As Eminem said, nothing. No suicide note. No manifesto why he was doing it. Ideology, there was none. His wealth did decline before the shooting. He spent a lot of time in casinos. He was what's called a high roller or a whale. And he dropped, I think, about half a million in casinos about 180,000 on credit cards and close to 100,000 on weapons. And his wealth declined from 2 million to about $500,000. He had three brothers. He only spoke to one, only one of his three brothers who said Paddock felt grandiose. That's what he felt about him. And he was grandiose. Why? His theme was, if I'm going to do anything, I want to be the biggest and the best. If I'm going to go out with a bang, I want to go out with a true bang. People will remember me for the rest of eternity. Grandiose. Narcissistic. That's what this guy really was about. And finally, they asked the sheriff at the time, he's still the sheriff now, was a shooting an act of terrorism. Now, that does, that's, there was an issue with that legally if Mandalay Bay had to like, discuss like, how to compensate the victims. On a state level, this was. On a federal level, no. But the sheriff said it was. He felt it was an act of terrorism. All right. At the end of the video is Eminem 
listening to school shootings. There's a bank of TVs, and he's hearing shooting in Galveston, Texas, shooting in California, mass shooting in a supermarket, shooting in a school, dozens of officers involved. And basically what he says is, you know, hey, when's this going to stop? He just walks away like in disgust. Is when people have enough and they vote enough is enough. I'm 58 years old. I've been through crazy moments in my life. And I've seen these campaigns. But the carnage goes on. This past July 4th, I think they said it was like the bloodiest weekend in America in a long time. I think it was like 200 people, maybe a little bit off, were killed over the weekend. July 4th weekend. We shoot ourselves with great regularity. I'm not here tonight to argue guns are bad, guns are bad. I'm not interested in that. And, you know, I'm not going to get into that debate. But when people that are mentally ill or vindictive get their hands on a gun, people get hurt. And I want to share something about this also. Because this song hit home for me when I heard it the first time several years ago. I live in Las Vegas. This show is broadcast. This channel is beamed out of Las Vegas, Nevada. The night that that happened was a Sunday night. I went to bed. I didn't go to the concert. But I woke up to like 25 text messages and phone calls from people around the country and around the world asking if I was okay. And I'm like, what are they talking about? And they said, were you at the shooting? Were you shot? Were you there? And I'm texting people back, you know, for like a good hour, hour and a half. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. I wasn't anything close to the concert. I wasn't there. I'm fine. My family's fine. But here's the rub. He didn't just kill people. He wounded a lot of people, and he created havoc for thousands more. People literally were running out of their shoes, out of their cowboy boots, just to try and get away. The emergency rooms were soaked in blood that night. It was insanity. Everyone was mobilized. People were rushing down there. So what did they do? They asked for volunteers to come to the convention center and try and help the victims out. I volunteered. And I went there for two days when things were really raw. And I probably counseled about six different people. And I, people I counseled would try and help those because it was like a 30 different boots for them to try and get they missing their medications. If they needed a plane ticket back home, they needed money for a hotel stay, they needed help getting a new pair of glasses. And they tried to do things to make it simple for the people. The FBI put together a, a, you know, a schematic of the concert where they put your stuff in the area that you might have been in. And people came in asking me for help. But the first thing they would ask is, do you, do you know if my boots are here, my, 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 my father's cowboy hat, my tools? People were working on the set. People were parking cars. They said, I got run over by 50 people who were running in terror and knocked me down and I injured my leg. So he didn't just kill the people that he killed and the wounded the people that he wounded. He terrorized thousands of people. I remember a guy telling me, I can't go back to work anymore. I hear a, a pop. I'm on the strip. I duck. PTSD. People couldn't get home. Their cars were, weren't, they couldn't get to their cars. It was insanity. And here's my point I want to explain about what this person really was. Normally you hear me say, here's a diagnosis. Here's an explanation for what this person did. There is no diagnosis. What he was was a narcissistic person who only cared about himself. He didn't need drugs. He didn't need alcohol. He didn't need depression because he wasn't mentally ill. He only cared about himself. And what he was going to do is ruin it for everyone else literally at the party because he didn't care. That's the true personification of evil. And I've assessed thousands of people, and yes, I've met a few of them that were not redeemable, that you couldn't fix with benzos, or with alcohol, or learning how to think differently, or to become caring, or to be nice, because that was not in their makeup. All they wanted to do was hurt others. 
he could have done so much good with the money he had left, but no, no, no. And I'm bringing up the service elevators because the only thing that now people realize was he couldn't even use the regular elevator. He went through the, you know, the workers' entrance, like through the kitchen, you know, where they bring in supplies, and probably paid a kid fifty bucks to help him carry up these very, very large duffel bags that were filled with weapons and ammo. That's what he was doing. That was the only thing that came out differently that no one picked up till it was too late. Why am I telling people this? Because next week I'm doing a training on narcissistic families, and I'm sorry, dysfunctional families. And one of the things you have to learn early in life that when someone's narcissistic, they don't care about you. They never will. They can go to therapy their whole life. They're not going to have kids because kids, are, you know, take away from their life. They're not going to be. They're not going to be caring to their spouse or their husband, man or woman. Let's make a difference. They only think about themselves. These are people that are evil, that wake up and only see things on their side. And these are the kinds of people. You got to either put down or you run from because they're going to ruin your life forever. There's no diagnosis for this. This is a person only wanted to create havoc and hell for these people. We had a resiliency center. Hundreds of people went to that trying to get over the trauma. I knew people that were shot. I knew people that were there. And they said nightmares and wake up screaming and didn't want to talk about it. Too frightening, too scary. They're going to carry that with them till the day they die because this person was unhappy with his life, how it turned out, and he wanted to go out in a different way by creating death and destruction. So I want you to realize this. I want you to understand this. Eminem did a great job trying to understand this person's mind. But sometimes there are things you can't explain. You can't explain why people are going to do something unless you understand the behavior, the attitude, and the mindset. Okay, no conscience. With that, I'm going to call it quits on this one. Bruce Muffs and LCSW Sunridge of Nevada giving you my clinical impressions of what took place that night and what this person really is. Thank you.